Well, good morning. It is a, uh, again, a pleasure of mine to be able to stand before you up here and to present God's Word as faithfully as I possibly can. Um, to be honest, this sermon was such an encouragement to me as I was pondering about it through, uh, throughout the week, as I was considering some of these truths, the realities, and how they apply to my life. Um, so I'm, I'm actually very excited, as I always am, to present it. But this time, I hope that whatever you guys can glean from this would be of our future hope. I want you guys, I know often we discuss our future hope as just eternity, and then we just kind of progress to whatever text we're in. But I want us to take a closer look as to what this reality is. I want us to take a look as to what our future holds for us and what Christ has accomplished for us and purchased for us. And all of this, even as great as some of these things will be, I want Christ to be glorified. I want us to see that none of this is possible apart from the grace of God to us. Um, if you will open your Bibles and turn to Revelation, we'll be in chapter 21. Let us read, and then we will pray. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as has been said earlier, thank you that we're able to gather together, Lord, freely, with no fear of oppression or persecution. Lord, help us to take these privileges that we have and make the best use of them. May our hearts and our minds be ready to receive your word, Lord. Oh, Father, if any of us fail to prepare throughout the week, be merciful, Lord. Bring power and grace to our hearts, Lord, that we may be able to accept your word, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would bless us with a greater sense of Christ. Lord, that we would behold the glory of Christ. That we would grow in our love for Christ. And Lord, as we consider what this future holds, may we remember that apart from Christ, it means nothing. If heaven, Lord, if eternal life is apart from Christ, then we should want nothing to do with it, Lord. But Father, we thank you that eternal life is found in Christ. And one day, Lord, these promises that we have, our faith will be made sight and we shall see him. But for now, Lord, we live by faith, trusting in you. Oh, Lord, open up our eyes to see wondrous things, Lord. Amen. Well, when we read through the book of Revelation, there is a tendency for us to want to get caught up in the apocalyptic symbolism that we find throughout the entire letter, right? Many theologians, pastors, preachers, Students have spent countless hours trying to decipher all of the symbols, 
trying to decipher what every quote means, what every star and every candle, what the dragon means, who's the dragon, and so much time is used up, and it is good. But if we're only caught up with the symbolism of it, then we will lose the message. We will actually lose the purpose. We will lose the context. If we're not careful, we'll actually lose the entire letter. If we subject the entire book of Revelation to literal interpretation, it's kind of fearful. There's really not much hope. And to be honest, it doesn't make sense. And this is one of the reasons why many of us through time have just kind of read through it, right? A speed read, and then we just go right back and we spend our time reading other books, which is still good. But when it comes to the revelation of John, we just kind of glance through it because we think to ourselves, there's so much symbolism. There's so much... Uh, prophetical and apocalyptical writing that you'd have to be a genius to interpret it. But it is not so. It is good for us to labor in the proper interpretation and exegesis of what all the symbolism is. However, our text for today will not deal so much with symbolism. It will not actually take up too much time in depicting uh, any stories, but it will give us a very clear picture it will give us a very clear uh, painting, you could say, a story that no one who reads it will be able to say, I couldn't understand that. There's too much symbolism in this. It'll actually be one of the more clear passages in the book of the Revelation. And if any of us would have any doubts to the meaning, let us remember that this is the proclamation of God's truth. We will be going back in time to learn what the future holds for all of humanity, what awaits all of us when we die or when the Lord returns. We will also see how certain this vision is. Just to give you guys an idea as to what's been happening, who's writing the letter, this is John. John has been exiled to the island of Patmos under the rule of Domitian and the year is 95 A.D., John at this time in his life has suffered much for the gospel. He's actually already died. He's been boiled, as tradition says, in oil. Cast out. And I was, I was explaining this to my wife. She just couldn't fathom that John was exiled. I mean, imagine you're told to go into an island by yourself. Stripped away from the people you've grown to love and those you love. And those that care for you. And in your old age, you're cast away. Imagine how lonely it must be. But you see, he isn't forsaken. Though he is alone in the presence of people, he is not forsaken. For Christ is with him. John is in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So he is worshiping. Right? He is considering everything that the Lord had spoken to him. He might even be considering what other apostles have said. But it is here that the Lord comes to John in a vision. And so as John is worshiping the Lord, the Lord appears to him. And he says to him, write what you are about to see. He commands him, what you see I want you to write. And the visions that are occurring, can you imagine? Some of this is very frightening if this is the first time you're hearing it. At this point, as the visions continue, he has heard the words of Jesus to the church, repent or else, repent or else. I have this against you, repent. He has seen the four horsemen. He has seen the dragon persecuting the woman. He has seen the beheaded saints. He has seen the smoke of God's enemies ascending into heaven. He has seen God's army. He has seen the angel of death. He has seen a great throne and a mighty king on that throne. And he has seen the judgment of the entire world. So imagine... You're on an island, exiled by yourself. And the Lord comes to you in a vision. And this is the vision. You could think to yourself, wow, I 
think I think the world is about to end then. Because what I'm what I'm hearing, it sounds like the time is very soon. And truly, the time is very soon. Along with this these visions, he has seen the dragon, Satan, and that false prophet cast into a lake of fire. And this is where we pick up in chapter 21, right? John has just experienced glorious visions, right? He has seen marvelous things. And now we go into our text, and this is what he writes immediately after seeing the lake of fire. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now you've experienced these visions, right? You've seen the pain of people. You've seen destruction. And then the Lord speaks hope, right? He gives you a vision of victory. Because John says... I saw these things, but then, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the first point that I want to draw your attention to is in verse 1. This is our dwelling place. A new heaven and a new earth awaits you. This is where you and I and all Christians will live for an eternity with God. A new heaven, a new earth prepared just for us. This is the inheritance which Jesus speaks of in Matthew 5, 5, commonly known as the Beatitudes. He says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Imagine that. That is your blessing, the earth. Throughout our entire life on this earth, we're reminded that we are just pilgrims, sojourners, aliens, foreigners, that this is temporary. We're even told this isn't our home. We don't even belong to this world. We're a part of it, but we don't belong to it. Listen to what Peter says. He says, Beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Right. So keep this in mind. This isn't our home. We have a heavenly home, a better earth that awaits us. And yet even today, creation itself is groaning for redemption. It is awaiting the moment of its redemption. Creation itself awaits the coming of the Lord. In Romans 8 we read, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Labor pains. Right? The creation is awaiting eagerly that regeneration for itself. There is something to note here. Our text describes this new earth as not having a sea. No sea. For some of you that love the sea, if I take a literal interpretation of this, I'm sorry that there's no more sea. However, I don't believe that this is what the Lord meant when He said, there shall be no more sea. Are we to assume that this actually means that the created sea is going to cease to exist? That there is no more need for it? Personally, I would agree with John Piper on this point. In a video where he was discussing eschatology, right, they're asking him about his interpretation on this certain point. And I'm going to paraphrase what he said. He said that the sea actually represented turmoil for the Jews. When they thought of the sea, they didn't think what we think, you know, Ferris wheels and hot dogs and a nice time at the beach with their family. To them, the sea was actually deadly. This is where they knew that the, the bravest of men, the most seasoned captains and the most seasoned crew 
with the largest ships could die if they were not careful. To them the sea could swallow them up whole. So it is not that the sea will cease to exist, but rather that turmoil will no longer be a part of heaven and earth. You see, there will be no more trouble for us. There will be nothing to fear anymore. With the sea being gone, the, the Jew at this point would have understood there's no danger. That means that the greatest thing that we fear is done. Imagine that. No more trouble. No more fear. No more uncertainty. But everlasting peace. A peace that will reign in your hearts forever. Unshakable. No fear of calamity striking us. But a place prepared for us. A place for all of the redeemed seed of Abraham. Which if you've placed your faith in Christ, you are also a part of. And this is what awaits you. No more trouble. Today your life is troubled. Whether it is because of sin. Whether it is because of your enemies, oppressors, health. It doesn't matter. There will be a time where it ceases. It's over. I know right now it's, it's impossible for us to really grasp that but take heart one day it's done just like that over also many have speculated that this means that God is going to destroy the world that we know today and create a new world right get rid of this earth and create a new earth however this interpretation is erroneous because then Romans 8:22 makes no sense why would creation be groaning for redemption if its end is destruction. So there's many that would try to persuade you that this creation will be destroyed and there will be another one. But there isn't much glory in that. Because at the, at the creation, God says it is very good. Everything He looked at pleased Him. It was sin that brought a curse onto this earth. But on that day, when the Lord returns in glory, even the earth will be regenerated. The earth will be renewed and you will finally inherit it and have dominion over it. No longer will creation be in bondage to sin. The curse of sin will actually no longer reign in any area of this new heaven and new earth, neither in dirt or trees, in animals, in the skies, in your heart, nowhere. Sin will not even be known anymore. It will be over. It will be done with. Our Lord's words, they just keep resonating in my heart as I was preparing this. He speaks to His disciples in Luke 21, 29, all the way through 33. It says, He spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand, meaning near. It is at hand, it is here. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. He says these words to Jerusalem after pronouncing judgment on them for rejecting the prophets, rejecting messengers, rejecting the gospel, rejecting Christ himself. And so Christ pronounces judgment on them. He says that this earth will pass away. And yet this holds true to this very day. Some of you might find yourself in rejection of this gospel. But I promise that you shall perish first before this earth perishes. If you yourself are alienated from Christ, there, there is hope for you, but there's a real fear. There's, there's very real fear that you shall actually die first before the earth even passes away. But you see, this new heaven is what awaits all of us, all the children of God, Christian, whether the Lord tarries 50 years or comes back tomorrow, many of us might die by then. 
Many of us might not even be here in 50 years. And yet this certainty remains of impending judgment. If the Lord tarried 50 years and returned and we're all still in good health, it would make no difference for the unbeliever. For he shall also find himself in judgment. I know that for some of us, due to age or illness and fear, death seems to be at the door, right? The days seem short. Health is failing. It seems like death is at the door knocking, just waiting for the slightest door to open so that it may enter. And sure, if you had no hope of Christ, you would be right to fear. It would be actually good of you to fear so that hopefully you would be awakened to your state. Ah, But if you have Christ, you can rest assured that when death comes to the door and the door is opened, Christ will be waiting for you at that moment. You see, the only thing that waits for you after death is glory. No more fear. Just glory. And while I know that none of us actually want to die, however, if we were to die or be faced with death, I want you to rest knowing that Christ has died on behalf of sinners. But you see, Christian, you actually, you have no need, no need to fear. Christ has prepared a room for you in this new earth. Do not fear, for death is but a ship that the Lord will use to bring you home. That is all that it is. The Lord will use death to complete your voyage through this tumultuous sea. As you travel from one country to the next, your journey will be complete. Your pilgrimage will be over. So when faced with death, embrace it. Embrace it as your ticket home. When death is certain, do not fear. Embrace it. For you will be able to say like Stephen, I can see Christ. I can see Christ. Even though my body is ready to die, I can see Christ. You see, there is one that awaits you eagerly. There is someone waiting for you along with all of his saints. There is someone waiting for you along with his father. And they've prepared a meal for you to welcome you home after a long journey, to welcome you home after your terrible trip through this life, after your pilgrimage, after all this time you spent sailing through the sea of life with all of its storms, everything that happens, they are waiting for you with a meal to welcome you, to say, come in, friend, dine with us, rest with us, lodge with us. There's no need for you to leave anymore. We have food. We have provision for you. We have rooms and family for you. You have no need to leave. But remember who it is that awaits you. It is Christ, eagerly, waiting for you. As vile as you may see yourself today, Christ awaits you. If you have trusted in Him, Christ awaits you and is awaiting your return. To this, as Christians, this should draw us comfort when we face the reality of death. Not just the idea of death. Obviously, the idea will bring fear to all of us. But when it is there, when it is certain, and let us continue to trust in Christ. You see, as John's vision continues, he sees a holy city descending from heaven and prepared as a bride. You see, again, I'm trying to show that not everything in the book of the Revelation is difficult to understand, right? We're seeing the end of time here, right? We're seeing what awaits everyone who's trusted in the Lord, and it is very clear. What John is seeing is a church of God being set upon this new heaven and earth by God Himself. Look at what the verse says. It says, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. A feast, right? A wedding seems to be occurring here. This is the picture that we are having. It is God Himself setting the church upon this new heaven and this new earth. He is the one that's perfected her through the blood of the Lamb and with the gospel has given her wisdom and purged her from all of her sins, cleansed her from all unrighteousness. 
Why? So that he may sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is the way that the church will be presented to Christ, perfect, holy, blameless, no wrinkle, perfectly adorned, beautiful. This is the way, Christian, that God even sees you today. Perfect. In Christ, righteous. In Christ, beautiful. Remember your own wedding day. Many preparations went in it. There was a lot of anxiety. There was eagerness. You wanted to see what your future spouse was going to look like in a dress or a tuxedo or whatever they were wearing. You wanted to see how their makeup was going to look. Wanted to see what earrings they were going to wear, what shoes they were going to wear, what, what were they going to say, what was going to be the reaction when they finally saw you. And you remember how beautiful that felt. That pales in comparison. That falls so short of what the bride and Christ are awaiting from each other. The way that Christ is waiting for his bride we can't even describe it. If I was to say he's eagerly waiting, it is not enough. But I wanted you to kind of get a sense of what emotions are in this, what it actually feels like. Remember your own wedding day. In this new heaven and earth, something glorious will also occur that hasn't happened since the days of the apostles. If you've been paying attention to the text, you would have read that God will dwell with His people. Right? That He will be with them. That He will tabernacle with them. You see, now that we've discussed the tabernacle, we kind of have to discuss what it meant in the Old Testament. Why is the tabernacle brought up? Right? We know we're dealing with symbolism, but why, why the tabernacle? The church knows nothing of a tabernacle. Right? New Testament church knows nothing of tabernacle worship, right? There's no Levitical priesthood anymore. There's no sacrifices being made. So why bring up the tabernacle? Well, the Jews would have understood that this is where worship happened. More than that, they would have understood that that is where God dwelled. If they wanted anything to do with worshiping God, they had to arrive at the tabernacle. And as long as the tabernacle remained in Jerusalem, God was with them. So to the first century Jew, they're understanding what John is saying as he's writing this letter. They're understanding what he means because they know the priesthood is over. Sacrifice is over. What this is saying is that God will be with us. God will be our God. We will be His people. But in discussing the tabernacle, remember, the average Jew was not allowed access into the tabernacle. It was off limits. Even at that, the high priest was only allowed to enter once a year. Before he entered, he had to make atonement or sacrifice for his own sin. But here, God dwells with his people, with all of them. For all of us will see him face to face. He will actually walk amongst us and we will walk with him and we will worship him and we will see him and we will touch him. We'll, we'll be able to see the one that died for us this is the reality of, of what awaits us. We will actually see Christ. No longer just looking back at the cross and saying, well, I'm awaiting the day to see the one who died for me. No longer just looking to the future and saying, well, I can't wait for that day to come. But we will actually be in His presence, knowing Him, hearing His voice. He will dwell with us. It is true, God dwells even now with us today through His Spirit in our hearts. But one day we will actually be with Him. No longer will we only see the passing glory the way Moses did, but we will actually see Him and we will not be consumed. We will not have to veil our face afterward, but we will see Him. We will know Him and we will walk with Him as Adam walked with Him in the Garden of Eden. In the same way, hand and hand, side by side, 
we will walk with Him. Please understand, this is true. This is real. It, this is almost a reality today. This is done. You see, this is the promise that anchors our soul. This is where we will finally see Emmanuel, right? God with us. We will walk with Him. What a beautiful promise is given to us. This promise is enough to anchor a fearful soul, to comfort the broken spirit, to empower the weak, to make us bold unto death, to forsake sin and to trust in Christ all the more. And what is this promise? God Himself shall be with them and be their God. You see, if you can maintain a heavenly mindset, if you can keep your mind focused on the things of above, what awaits for you, this should move your soul to worship, to obedience. This should move you to honor God with all that you are. And yet there, God will do something so loving that it moves the coldest Christian to tears. He will do something so glorious, so loving that all of us await. This pilgrimage of ours has been filled with troubles. The ways of sin have berated our lives constantly. The storms of life have thundered over us day by day, day and night. The sea of death has swallowed up our loved ones with no partiality. We've lost friends, family, to death, young and old. In their prime and in their illness, we've lost them to death. Our bones have been crushed under the weight of sin, under the accusations of Satan, under the daily dealing with God's enemies, for His enemies are our enemies. Tears have flowed from our eyes, much like the rain has fallen from the darkest clouds in the fiercest storm. But what do we read in verse 4? And God shall wipe away tears from their eyes. No more tears. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things have passed away. They're over. They're done with. Imagine that, a life of trouble. A life of constant fear and sin and accusation and tears of repentance, tears of joy, tears of pain, of suffering, wiped away, done and over with, no more. It is as if God Himself is saying, come here, son, and let me comfort you. Let me be your peace. Now we have to ask ourselves, what, what has happened to these things? Where has sorrow and pain and fear, where have they gone? Are they just kind of waiting in the shadows to attack us? Should we be looking over our shoulder like some paranoid Christians? No. They've been put to death. They've been put to death in Christ. They are no more existent. They are over done, completely finished. They were conquered by the lover of our souls in His resurrection and in His death. As if it wasn't enough to behold God's glory, He puts away everything that has troubled us since our lives began, since we were children. He puts them away. He casts them away. But where? Where do these things go? You see, this new earth and this heaven that awaits for us they know nothing of sin's curse. They know nothing of the pain and suffering. From sinners to creatures, sin is no more. But even now, there's a very true reality for us. We read in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So even now, Christian. Even now, all these things have been put away. You are a new creature, no longer in bondage to sin, no longer enslaved to the desires of your flesh, but alive to Christ. But please notice where it is that Christ makes this declaration. 
Where is it that God makes such a declaration? Look at verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. On his throne, as a king, this is where he makes that declaration. This is where he says, over and done with. As the ruler of all creation, he has declared his edict over all of it. With full authority, these words are faithful and true. In verses 6 and 7, we receive another encouragement and more promises. He says, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. What is that first encouragement? It is done. From his throne, sitting over his enemies, ruling over his enemies, he says, it is done. Stating that this truth is secure in the fact that he who spoke it is called faithful and true. Right? We read in a previous chapters in Revelation that Christ is called faithful and true. And He is the one speaking this. Also, it is secure in the work in which Christ declared it is finished. As the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, He has declared it all. Matthew Henry had some really good insight on this in his commentary. I'm going to paraphrase it. But he basically goes on to say, As the Alpha, all things have their um, purpose, their beginning in Him. Right? All things have their purpose in Him. As the Omega, all things have their culmination in Him. As the beginning, everything finds its first move. And at the end, as as the ending of all things, right? Everything is for His glory. Everything. His whole plan, everything is for His glory. You see, the one that thirsts for this to come, the one that is thirsty for this to actually happen already, Christ offers freely to them the water of the fountain of life. You, Christian, are welcome to come and drink freely. No charge, no limitation. Until your thirst is satisfied, you are welcome to drink. This fountain is none other than Christ Himself. This is the fountain that gives life to everyone. If you will turn in your Bibles to John chapter 7, we'll read what Christ says in reference to being this fountain. We will be in verses 37 through 39. He says, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they saw that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. But you see, our Jesus is glorified now. This is the one that offers you to drink from His fountain, from Himself, freely. And what does it cost? Nothing. It doesn't cost anything. It is offered completely, limitless, free. So Christian, please Christian, drink of this water. In this world filled with all filled with all things that will soon be put to death, we are promised that any of us that overcome will inherit all things. This is our promise. If we overcome, we shall inherit all things. How shall we overcome though? Do we go to war? Is there something we must do? No, we shall shall overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. We shall reign with Him. We shall be kings with Him. We shall be His servants, His sons, brothers and daughters, 
sisters. Ah, but there is yet another promise for those who reject this Messiah. There is another promise for those who want nothing to do with this fountain of life. Let us go on to verse 8 where he says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and sorcerers and idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And let me say this in no, no joking manner. If you thought to yourself that hell was just uh, a symbolic place, if you thought to yourself that this was just a, a fearful tactic being used, there is no symbolism here. There is no apocalyptic message here. Here we can apply a literal interpretation to this to mean a lake of fire where the worm doesn't die, where torment is everlasting, where God's wrath is poured out over all of His enemies. You see, this is the alternative to rejecting Christ. No one is going to escape His sight. No one is going to escape the justice of God. But you see here, there is a place also for inheritance. There is also a place that awaits for you. If you continuously reject Christ, if you continuously put aside the things of Christ, this offer of forgiveness to you, the one who cries out to his people, drink from me, is the same one that cries out to sinners, drink from me. But if you would have nothing to do with this Christ, if you would love your lies more than you would love Christ, if you, if you would love sorcery, if you would love idolatry and whoremongering, if you would love these things more than Christ, see what you are trading in for your soul. You are trading in an entire paradise prepared for God's people. And even worse than that, you are trading it in for a glorious Son of God. So what are you to do? What are we to do? As Christians, let us drink from this fountain day after day. When you feel like life is overcoming, trust in Christ. When you have death at the door, trust in Christ. Remember, this is not your home as comfortable as this place may be for you. No matter how much wealth you have accumulated, how much health you've experienced, this is not your home. This is temporary. And yet also, if you reject Christ, this isn't your home. This isn't yours either. For you have a home waiting for you. You are also a pilgrim here. Because there is an everlasting home for you. Where Satan, his angels, the false prophet, they are all there. So run to Christ. Run to Him. He shall not cast you out if you come to Him. He will not push you aside as unclean. He will not look at you as disgusting if you were to come to Him. But on the contrary, with open arms He would embrace you. With pity He would love you. With compassion He would heal you. This is the Christ. If you reject, this is the one you are rejecting. The one on His throne who has already pronounced judgment on this world. Let us pray.